I'm on, okay. It's good having you all here this morning. You know, that's a Delway song, and uh, I've listened to uh, Delway do that song, and he does a great job with it, but I want to tell you, I love the way Nick Hunt does that song. <laughs> well, thank you, Nick. I appreciate that, even though I forgot to remind you. Usually, I call you at the last minute. I give him a long notice, didn't I? You were... But he was on vacation having a good time, so he probably did too, long too long a notice. There you go. <laughs> well, what about Jesus? Great song. You know, there's, there's so many things that we overlook in our lives from day to day, and sometimes that's Jesus himself. And I hope that song that uh, many of you grabbed uh, your attention this morning, that was the purpose of it. And just to be sure, I want to do a little recap with you here. What we actually heard was that according to a morning paper, a church had spent $40 million, think about that amount of money, to rebuild and remodelize or modernize their church building. They're updating their church building. So they spent a lot of money on that. And it spoke about how the walls would be of granite with fancy marble floors. Man, this is going to be top-notch place. And what about the stained glass windows? along with the finest wood on the doors, they were going to do it right. They were going to make it shine. It also seems that at the dedication of the church rebuilding, they invited the mayor and all the important people of the town and city hall. And of course, they invited the media, newspapers, radios, TV. They would all be there. They made sure of that. But nowhere was there a mention of an invite for Jesus. And where was the invite for the lost and the hurting? Not one time was it mentioned. They missed the point. And this seems to be a, uh, a pattern in our society today. It happens in our homes, in our schools, our jobs, in government, and of course, in our churches. It happens everywhere. Jesus is not invited and kept out in a way more often these days because it makes people uncomfortable. And it's not politically correct to speak the name of Jesus Christ. So it makes people uncomfortable. They, they keep him out, keep him away. You know, we talked about last week many times at an arm's distance. But some people want him way out. They don't even want him in the building. It's not much different today than it was in the earlier days when it came to Jesus. Not a lot of difference there. There was a story that I want to share with you that gives a good example. A television executive called the pastor of a metropolitan church in another city and told the pastor, I think that my son is in your city involved in the drug culture. He then asked the preacher if he would try to find the boy and do something with him. About four months later, the boy was found and told the gospel. He accepted Jesus as his Lord and Savior. The preacher told the boy to pick up the extension on the phone and he would call his father. The preacher told the father that his son had been found and he accepted Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. The father replied, I don't care about that. I want to know, how long is his hair? Has he taken a bath? Will he apologize to his mother? With hearing that, the boy who'd been listening on the other end jumped up, ran out of the study, and his father never saw him again. What about Jesus? Everything else in our lives seems to be more important from time to time. And we don't, probably don't mean for it to be that way. We probably don't realize it's that way sometimes, but if we stop and focus of all the things we own, all the things we have, all the things we possess, how did we get them? Jesus Christ, right? Come from the Lord. They're, they're, they're here for us, but they're only temporary. This week, there will be many meetings held across our country in the name of Jesus. Everywhere. Many meetings. But he'll be pushed aside. Jesus will be pushed aside for man's own agenda. 
Which leads us to the question this morning. Is Jesus welcome among us? Or does he just get in our way? You know, that may seem like an odd question to ask here in church, right? Is Jesus among us? But if we were to give it some thought, it's really not. It's really not an odd question because we can sit here in this church, we can be in praise and worship to God, and we can welcome him into the church, but each individual has to welcome him into their heart and keep them in there every day. Join me in uh, Mark, the book of Mark, chapter 6, beginning at verse 6. When I say this might be an odd question, we're going to look at Mark here. Mark chapter 6, beginning at verse six, uh, verse 1, I'm sorry. Verse 1. Verse 1, Jesus left there and went to his hometown accompanied by his disciples. When the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were amazed. Where did this man get these things, they asked? What's this wisdom that has been given him? What are these remarkable miracles he is performing? Isn't this the carpenter? Isn't this Mary's son and the brother of James, Joseph? Judas and Simon, aren't his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his own town, among his relatives, and in his own home. He could not do any miracles there except lay hands on a few sick people and heal them. He was amazed at their lack of faith. Now I want you to jump with me. Of course, Jesus is preaching to them. And we're going to jump down to verse 28. On uh, Luke, Luke chapter 4, verse 28. I'm sorry, I thought we were on the same page. And if we think about what we just read, or, or no, I'm sorry, I got you in the wrong place. Let's go to Luke chapter 4, verse 16. This will tie it together. Amen. In the verse we just read, we find that Jesus had arrived at his own hometown, though. He was at his own hometown of Nazareth. After traveling and performing miracles everywhere. Nazareth was a city where Jesus grew up. Many of us know that. He lived and worked among the people who lived there. They knew who Jesus was. And knew his family because they lived there also. So Jesus wasn't a stranger. He's in his own hometown where he grew up. And this wasn't the first time he had returned to Nazareth since beginning his public ministry. He'd been there earlier. Three years earlier. So we're going to pick up in, in, right here in Luke. Chapter 4, verse 16. It says, He went to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue as was his custom. So he went into the synagogue to preach. Now he's, once again, remember, he's among people that know him. He's among friends and family members and everything. So in Luke, if we jump down, if we look at uh, Luke chapter 4, verse 16. I guess I better go there with y'all, huh? Getting ahead of myself, sorry. You know, sometimes you just get excited about a, a message and you just run with it. And I'm running crazy. Here. Sorry. Jesus, uh, Luke chapter 4, verse 16. It says, he went to Nazareth where he had been brought up, and on the Sabbath day he went into the synagogue, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unfold, unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to proclaim the good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. He began by saying to them, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. All spoke well of him and, and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his lips. Isn't this Joseph's son, they asked? Jesus said to them, Surely you will quote this proverb to me. Physicians heal yourself 
and you will tell me, do here in your hometown what we have heard that you did in Capernaum. Truly, I tell you, can you, no prophet is accepted in his hometown. I assure you, there were many widows in Israel in Elijah's time when the sky was shut for three and a half years and there was severe famine throughout the land. Yet Elijah was not sent to any of them, but to a widow in Zarephath in the region of Sidium. And there were many in Israel with leprosy in the time of Elijah, the prophet. Yet no one, yet not one of them was cleansed, only Nathan and Syrian. All the people in the synagogue were furious when they heard this. They got up, drove him out of town, and took him to the brow of a hill on which the town was built in order to throw him off the cliff. But he walked right through the crowd and went on his way. Okay, they welcomed Jesus at first, right? Until he started calling them out. He started pointing out issues that they had going on. All at once, he's not welcome there anymore. That's life. That's day-to-day right there, that stuff. Okay, Jesus, come on in. But when he touches on our sin, get out. Right? Isn't that the way it works? Get out. Or he opens that closet door and those sins start coming out. We got hidden in there that he knows there is anyway. We want him to go away. Get out of the house. Right? That's what they're doing here. They wanted him there. When he said all the good things, he said all the right things. Come on in. But the minute it went south, and he's calling them out and pointing out things, it made them uncomfortable. They want him to get away. And we got to remember that these people knew Jesus. They weren't strangers to him. They were his family members, his friends. He grew up in this town. Everybody knew him. Yet, they had a problem with him all at once. Don't we see a lot of that in today's society? People we know. People we know. And we've known in the past. Now they talk about Jesus Christ. That makes us uncomfortable. Some people, right? Probably the people that haven't accepted Christ said, what got into this guy? He didn't turn into a holy roller. That was me. I was saying things that my friends didn't want to hear. I was talking about Jesus, which made them uncomfortable. And I understand that. I understand that. Before I was a Christian, before I came to know the Lord, I walk up in a crowd, somebody's talking about Jesus, I'm uncomfortable, and I walk away. Not anymore. The crowd walks away. Because you want to talk about Jesus, let's get it on, right? It's a whole different deal, but they're saying, hey, this, this isn't a guy we know. He really doesn't need to be in our group anymore. He's not really one of our friends anymore because he's done gone down a path we don't want no part of. You got friends like that? Many of you can witness that. I'll bet you. Amen. You've been treated that way. Jesus wasn't welcome in his own hometown. What's that feeling like? There's people sitting here today that's not welcome in their own family's homes anymore, our relatives' homes, our friends' homes anymore because they accepted Jesus Christ and they talk about him. It's not anything new. So it is any surprise to us, Jesus is not welcome in many people's lives and activities today. Should it be a surprise to us? No, not at all. Last week, our message spoke on how close our walk was with Jesus. And is it close enough that we'll allow Jesus into every area of our lives? Remember, we talked about last week, Danny stood like a little, uh, what do you call him? A little pel- uh, uh, flamingo on one deal, yeah. You know what? That was crazy, wasn't it? But you will not believe the hits and replies I got for that standing in that little circle with all them guys. If that's what it takes to get your attention, okay. Okay. That was great. You bet. We can all stand like flamingos, can't we? Hopefully, none of us would deny Jesus and refuse to welcome him to be become close to us. Oh, none of us are that way. I pray we all trusted him as our Lord and Savior. But we might be guilty of robbing Jesus of his deity. We could be that. We we deny Jesus of his deity when we go our own way and we refuse his will in our lives. 
We're denying him. Jesus isn't a God that's far off. Jesus isn't a God that's far off and unaware of our needs. He's not like that. He's not down the road or he's not hiding from us. He's not far away. He's right there. That quick. But that's the problem. Sometimes we don't want him right there. We got something going on. We don't want him to have any part of us. Well, if that's the truth, then you don't need to have any part of it. Amen? That's not, that's not where we need to be. If you get that uncomfortable feeling that you're getting into something that you hope Jesus isn't watching, then you don't need to be doing it. Psalm, Psalm 46, uh, chapter 46, verse 1 says, God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. ever presence. You know, one problem that happens in, with modern churches in some churches, they no longer have a burden for revival. In the old days, revival was very important. I mean, that was a church thing. You might see two or three in a year at one church. But it's no longer that way. They're not interested in a closer walk with Jesus. Some even tend to keep Jesus at a distance. Have you ever been to a church where they preached all morning and never mentioned the word Jesus? If you did, get out of the church. Wrong place to be. But if we were to evaluate our church and its walk with Jesus, what would that look like? If we were to evaluate our church. Almost six years ago, I don't know the exact number, Denise will. Almost six years ago, we dedicated this property and building to God and confirmed through prayer and praise that Jesus was welcome here. At the back of this sanctuary, somewhere right there in front of that uh, sound booth, many of you may not know, but I have the GPS coordinates. I just can't tell you exactly where it is right now, but uh, in front of that sound booth, there's a time capsule. And it's signed by the names of people attending the dedication and included a holy Bible stating that we would always be standing on God's word. This building was built on God's word. We welcomed him. He was present. And just as we welcomed Jesus back then, he's still welcome here today. That hasn't changed. And we've witnessed just what can happen when Jesus is welcome and comes first in our lives and in our church and around. Look around you. This was just dirt at one time. We we're in a little old building over there, overcrowded. This was a vision. God led us here and we welcomed him to be the big part of it. We didn't get ahead of him. We followed him. That's why you're capable of sitting here today. And he continues to good, do good things as long as we continue to make sure he's first and foremost in this church. Amen. Many of you probably know where we came from, know where we are today. What a change. One danger we face today is that Jesus Christ is all too familiar to all of us. We've gone to church over and over through the years, heard the message of his coming and the story of his life. Everyone's heard that if you've been in church very long. We've heard his teachings. We know about his death on the cross, his burial and resurrection, and his ascension to glory in heaven. And all that sometimes in danger of us forgetting the wonder of it all. We've heard it over and over again. We, I want to say we got comfortable like the new Christian that's on fire for the Lord, it's very easy for that fire to start to dim and burn out if we're not careful. You know, the awe of Jesus Christ uh, may dim to us sometimes. And our, our eyes may look away. Our hearts become callous. To his calling, when he has calling on our lives, we kind of just say, hey, that's not for me. We find more complaints in church than we find praise. The 
the fire's going out. It dims from time to time if we're not careful. And one of Jesus' warnings to one of the hardworking churches in Asia was this. You have left your first love. It's a warning. I think we need to be aware of that. We need to be aware, once again, not just in this message, but last week's message, how close are we to the Lord? Are we so far away that the fire just keeps getting dimmer and dimmer? We find ourselves that we're so far away that it's easier not to return? I don't know how that works. I'm going to be honest with you. I don't know how that works. I don't know how someone in ministry... Someone that attends a church has a family of church members or just members that they know that can walk away and never step foot back in a church again or even be around it. I don't know how that works. I, I don't know how I could do that. That's between them and God, amen? We're warned in Hebrews chapter one, uh, 2, verse 1. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 1. For this reason, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. Amen. Are you in God's Word? Are you reading God's Word? Do you understand it? Terry shared with me a person that she knows that has been in church all of her life. She's older than Terry. Of course, everybody's older than Terry. <laughs> but through all that, she's coming to Terry for questions about the Bible, about the Lord. She didn't get it. She sat in church all her life and she didn't get it. Where are we missing it? Where are we missing it? Where is it that we're not being clear what God can do for a person. What his will is for in our lives. You know anybody like that? Well, God put somebody in this lady's path that has changed a lot of things already in a small period of time. You may be that person. Jesus Christ might be sitting right next to you right now today and you wouldn't even know. Or would you? Do you feel his presence? Do you seek his words? If he walked in those back doors in sackcloth and sandals, long hair, would we welcome him? Amen, we would. Amen. That has nothing to do with it. If we counted how everybody's dressed walked in this building, we wouldn't have nobody in here. Right? Because throughout the whole Bible, I can't find one place where it tells me what I got to wear to church. It just says, show up. Right? Come as you are. Show up. We need to treat everybody that way. There's not anybody that walked through those doors this morning that hadn't had a problem in their life at one time or another. And this is the place to lay it at the foot of the cross. Where Jesus says, welcome. And takes care of it. How does a Christian continue to welcome Jesus? This is the good one. By being humble. By being humble. That's how you welcome Jesus. If we're not humble, we'll miss the opportunity to welcome Jesus into our homes, our family lives, and our friends' lives. And every other area of our lives by being humble. God's not about the proud. Amen. Amen. To be humble is to rely on Jesus for everything and all things in our lives. That's being humble. Understanding that it's his will if we get it. He gives us the knowledge, the strength, the ability to obtain possessions. But let's not believe that we did it. Let's remember Jesus did it. He allowed us to have it. And the more we welcome him by being humble, the more he pours out on us. Had that conversation this morning with someone here. How God's blessed them. And many of you could testify to the same thing. To keep the first love of Christ warm and fresh within us, we must share. Ooh, big word. 
This is where we talk about that, right? Share that love of Christ in ways that makes others welcome him and love him. We want them doing it also. It's not about us, right? It is in the giving of the gospel of grace. And we're kind of dealing with a little of that right now, getting people to understand the Old Testament and the New Testament. Old Testament's by law, New Testament's by grace. And it's a struggle for a person that's a new Christian or not a Christian at all to understand the difference. But grace. Jesus shows grace everywhere he went, everything he did. He showed grace to others. And when we show grace to others, that's one of the greatest gifts of heaven we could ever want is showing grace to others. Sometimes we struggle with that. You ever said, well, they don't deserve it? Oh, don't say that. Because that's what Jesus says. You don't deserve it, but I'm willing to give it. Right? Oh, my goodness. Today, we should be striving to make sure we welcome Jesus into every part of our lives. Not just the parts we want him in, but every part. Especially when we find ourselves in situations where we feel he hasn't been welcomed. If you find yourself in a position with a your job, with family, with friends, or in a place where you don't feel Jesus is welcome, then you should immediately, immediately say, what about Jesus? Ooh, that's hard. Because that word of Jesus, that word Jesus, it scares people today. Some say, I'm not sure about that hell thing. I'm not sure God's going to send me there. You know what? You don't have to believe that. When you die, if you don't believe in Christ and then and there's no heaven, then you're just dead. You're just worm food, right? That's it. It's over. You're done. That time is over. You'll never know. Never know, right? You're just gone. But if you're wrong, you'll know forever. Make sure we got Jesus welcome in our homes, in our families, with our friends, in our jobs. Let's get it back in the government. Get it back in our schools. Jesus should be welcomed everywhere. 1 John chapter 4, verse 15 says, If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in them and they in God. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, we come to you this morning just thankful in all things. Father, we are thankful that you're welcome here and you, you hear us when we welcome you here, that you come and sit among us, that we can feel your presence just throughout this building. Father, I'm so pleased and get excited like everyone else. We do see that we get excited on Sunday mornings. But we shouldn't be just excited on Sunday morning. We should be excited all week long. Welcoming you in everything we do. Father, I know sometimes the world can be a struggle. So I pray today that we focus on when we're in situations that we're uncomfortable. Situations that we're not sure of. Father, we call on you. That we invite you into that situation. We seek your will and your way and what we should do there. Father, we're so thankful that you loved us enough to forgive us of our sins and shortcomings in our lives. And Father, that you choose to stay close to us. And I pray today that each and every one who hears my voice would choose to stay close to you. Father, I pray today that everything we did was uplifting, glorifying, and pleasing to you. We ask this in Jesus' holy and precious name. Amen.